Great. Well, again, thank you everybody for coming. I hope you enjoyed lunch. Um, after lunch, uh, we often have dessert and uh, it's my, my opportunity to introduce our, our speaker here, uh, Karen Coppenhaver, who's joining us uh, and will be talking to us a bit about uh, intellectual property and licensing and open source software. Uh, Karen has been uh, instrumental uh, to both the ITB2 Foundation uh, and the ITB2 Transmart Foundation, was involved very directly in the merger of the two foundations, uh, and has been uh, a key asset for us as we think through our intellectual property issues with respect to open source software and data. Uh, Karen is a, a partner in a local law firm, uh, Choate Holland Stewart. Um, she is also uh, the Director of Intellectual Property for Linux Foundation. She's actively involved in things with Apache Software Foundation. Uh, she started her career back in uh, 1990, was it? 1979. <laughs> in 1979, where she worked with IBM uh, in the Microelectronics Division and was uh, involved in, in the opening of the architecture for IBM there for the PC. So Karen has a tremendous experience uh, with open architectures, open software, and open data. And uh, I'm very pleased to introduce her and, and have her uh, tell us a bit more about this. Thank you very much. I am really humbled to be in this room because I don't know very much at all about what you do. Uh, but I know a lot about how open source communities have evolved in the computer industry because I had the really wonderful opportunity to be there as they, as they developed. And what I, I can't say to you is that your communities will develop in exactly the same way, but I can tell you that there's a lot of learning that we would love to share with you so that you don't make some of the same mistakes that we did. Uh, so I, I have to, you know, all lawyers have to start out with this because many of you are at companies and I want to be clear, you know, I am a lawyer. I've been a lawyer since 1978. Uh, I am not your lawyer. You all have lawyers at your company. And that's, that is one of the, uh, uh, I am not your lawyer is, a, is an often uh, comment made on the, on the chat. I, I'm here as a memoirist. I'm here to tell you my story because there are many ways to tell this story, but I can only tell it to you the way I learned it and experienced it. It's not legal advice, and you should always consult and listen to your own attorneys. I'm going to talk about the evolution of the revolution and where it all began. How many of you know a lot about Linux and the Apache Foundation and that story? If you a lot, well, number of you. So you can all raise your hands and tell me when I get it wrong, because this is like an elephant in that you can touch different parts and you will tell the story in very different ways. But this is the way I experienced it. And the first time I began working uh, with open source was about 1995. Uh, and I was uh, doing some work for IBM. And I first read the GPL when a wonderful, wonderful man who was both an IBM fellow and somebody who was always elected the best manager at the facility. So just a, a one, Dale Critchlow was his name. And uh, I was doing some work for them and I read the GPL for the first time, which is the general public license, which is the copyleft license that Richard Stallman put out. And I had maybe 30 or 40 different pieces of software that I was reviewing that they wanted to use. And when I read the GPL, I said, you know, all of these are fine, but this one, you know, the, <laughs> I don't know what that is, but you know, let, let's find something else. So Dale called me on the phone and I have to tell you, I stood up when I answered the phone. I mean, it's like you know, if you're talking to Dale Critchlow, I stood up and he said, he said, Karen, uh, I heard that you were telling us that we should get a different math library. And I, I said, well, well, well Dale, have, have, you, have you read that license? And he said, well, well, no, I haven't. He said, but I can tell you a few things that you might wanna know. And he said, one is that math libraries are very hard to write. And there are very few people who are able to write them well. And math libraries become more and more valuable as they're used because it's only through use that you find the little bugs and, and errors that need to be fixed. And the more that a math library is used and the harder it's used, the better it gets and the more valuable it gets. This math library has been used at universities all around the globe for almost a decade. You do not want me to get another math library. 
And that was my first introduction to open source, shared resources, peer reviewed code, uh, you know, invaluable developers. And I took that very seriously. So we're gonna start the story. That's, that's where my story starts. It actually starts a long time before that because Richard Stallman is the one that wrote the GPL. How many people know what the GPL is and know Richard Stallman? Do I have a few? Yeah. So to understand Richard, who is an unusual person, um, but to understand him really, you have to even go back you know, before all this started when uh, software was not really valued in the computer industry. You know, software was given away with the hardware for a long time. It was in 1967 that IBM was, uh, was uh, in negotiations with the Justice Department over a big antitrust case. And they knew that there were many different claims that the Justice Department may, might make, and one claim they were worried about. And that was that, that uh, IBM sold the software and hardware as one product. They didn't separately price the software. Therefore, nobody could really compete with the software. And that in the law is called a tie, that you took you know, your monopoly power in the hardware and you extended it to this other thing called software. So IBM decided that that was a claim they did not want to defend, and they did something called unbundle. They took the software and decided to price it separately as a separate product. And on that day, the software industry was born. Because up to that point, how could anybody compete with software that was given away for free and that was supported as part of your hardware? But once there was an industry created, there were lots of questions about how do you protect software? You know, what is software? Is it, is it patentable? Well, one thing we knew at that point was that it was not patentable. There were a lot of cases that indicated that patents wouldn't be extended to software. So we just assumed it wasn't patentable. And then, well, well is, it, is it copyrightable? Well, copyright is really for expression. It's for artistic works. Uh, is it really appropriate to have software in object code form be copyrighted, source code form? You know, is it a trade secret? I mean, there were lots of very complicated questions. Should we write something new? You know, should we come up with something new? Uh, and through those negotiations, one of the things that happened, and it was a huge thing, was the companies decided that they would protect the source code as a trade secret and that they wouldn't distribute it. That wasn't necessarily obvious, because let me just talk to you for a second about reverse engineering. You know, in every industry on earth, if you release a product, your competitors will get one. They will rip it to shreds and learn everything that they can about your product and use what they learn, other than those things that are protected by patent, to make better products. That's been true forever. Everybody reverse engineers their competitors' products. But in the software industry, it's the only industry in which no reverse engineering is permitted. And that was a shocking thing. See, it doesn't shock us now because we're used to it. But Richard Stallman, who was really one of the most brilliant programmers of his generation and maybe of any generation, Richard Stallman had always gotten the source code up until this point, and he was able to fix the source code. And he was able to share the corrections and the extensions that he created to make life better for his friends. And the idea that he would get software and he wouldn't get the source code was offensive to him. And he thought it was a civil rights issue because he was not allowed to share his changes. So sometimes people think that Richard you know, was, was way out there, but in a way, Richard was being extremely conservative. He was saying, do not change this industry so that I cannot make the code better. So what Richard came up with was this creative thing called the general public license, the GNU general public license. And he said, I'm going to use the intellectual property in my software, which, which at this point we were assuming was going to be copyright. I'm going to use that intellectual property and I'm going to uh, use it to enforce freedom. So I'm not giving up my copyright. And this is up something that a lot of people get confused about is that open source means that uh, uh, that there is no intellectual property in the code. That's not true. 
Open source means that he was taking his rights in the code that he wrote, and he was saying, you can use this code, but you have to comply with my license. And if you distribute code that, it, that is based on my code, that code has to be distributed under my license. And my license requires you to provide source so, code so people can fix it and share the modifications. That's what the GPL was all about. And you know, many people think you know it's it's a uh, it's an outrageous uh, statement. But he went on to uh, build some of the most valuable software around. So there's something called you know the the uh, the compiler, the GNU compiler. And whenever anybody tells me that they work in a software shop and they absolutely don't use any GPL code, I say, well, how do you compile it? You know, because there are many of the things that Richard wrote that most everybody uses. Even, you know, even Microsoft uses. Uh, he wrote very, very, very valuable tools and put them out under his license with the mission that if everybody wanted to use his tools, that he would be able to change the course of the industry to require the sharing of software. Very interesting. So um, he invented this thing called copyleft, which is using copyright to enforce this uh, source code sharing obligation. And he started something called the Free Software Foundation. Pretty amazing, still, still very active today. Richard's still very active today. So now I go down to my unsung hero of the open source world, Brian Bellendorf. Brian Bellendorf was a young fellow. Uh, how, how many people know who Brian Bellendorf is? Oh, there he is, a co-fan, co-fan. Co Brian, Brian, so Brian was out in, on the West Coast and he, uh, he was the, the, the son of two programmers, which I, I find kind of awesome. And he went to Stanford very young uh, and, and decided, you know what I really want to work on? I'm really interested in whether I could um, uh, have a, a software project that people could work on 24 seven. You know, as the globe turns around, could I build this thing so that I work on it and then somebody in Hawaii works on it and then somebody in Japan works on it. You know, pass or could, could I build the structure that would allow us to do that in collaboration as the globe turned? So he started a little project that he was, was a web server. He thought, well, that'd be a good thing. I will, we'll develop a web server. That's what, that's what we'll build, a web server. What just so happened that IBM at the same time was also trying to build a web server. You know, and they had worked very hard on it. They spent a lot of money on it. And at one point they looked up and they said, we are really ought to look at this kid's web server. And they went to look at it and they said, it's better. It's, it's not a little better, it's a lot better. And that Apache web server, for those of you who are online, I'm pretty sure you're using it right now. It's like 98, 99% of the web servers on earth. And it came from Brian Bellendorf's project. Brian wasn't as concerned about sharing source code. Brian's idea was that if you build really great code, really great code, and you have a compelling project so that the code is supported in that project, no one's going to want to get the code from any place else. They're all going to want to participate in that project. And if you don't build code that good, then shame on you. So he wasn't worried about bringing the lawyers in to enforce any kind of copyleft license. He said, build great code, build it in collaboration, and you'll take over the world. And he did. And he did. Uh, so he built the Apache web server, which became IBM's one of IBM's uh, first uh, forays into open source. And also around that was created the Apache Foundation. And they used his Apache license, which was developed with IBM, um, to uh, they have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of projects in the Apache Foundation. It's an enormously valuable asset. They came out of Brian's work. And his was a permissive license because he wasn't worried about enforcing this source code sharing obligation. And he actually just didn't want to have the lawyers so much around, I think. Uh, Brian is now, I'm very happy to say, Brian is also uh, works with the Linux Foundation. He's the head of the Hyperledger project, which is the blockchain technology, which he thinks will have both uh, health applications and other, you know, many, many applications. Just a fabulous, fabulous human being. Then came Linus. Some people say Linus, but it's really Linus. And Linux rhymes with Cynix, so it's a little bit different. But Linus was a young guy over in Finland. And 
he uh, took the GNU tools. So Richard created the GNU tool set. And what was needed was a kernel for an operating system. And Linus wrote this note, which has now become sort of famous and said, I thought I'd start an operating system, not too professional or anything. If anybody wants to help, that'd be great. You know, I mean, I can't remember the exact words, but it's not like that. And he began this project as just, you know, I think he was 17 at the time. He still works on Linux. There isn't a line that has come into Linux that he has not approved. He is an awesome uh, mind and individual. Uh, so he took the GNU tool set and created the kernel and the operating system. And Richard would prefer that we call it GNU Linux because it acknowledges the context of the use of the GNU operating system. Our, our GNU uh, tool set. And because the GNU tools at that time were under GPL version two, I'm not going to get into too many licenses here, but because they were under that license, the kernel was under G2 also. But Linus had some very specific ideas. And one is he didn't want anybody to be able to change his license without you know, his, his uh, involvement. And GPL generally says it's GPL, this version, or any later version. And Lena said, no, no, it's GPL 2.0 only. It's going to be 2.0. I know what that is. We're going to build our community around 2.0. It's not going to change. And the other thing that he did, which became hugely valuable, is that he put a copying file, which is it's a notice in the, in the Linux kernel. It's still there. You can still go find it. Because there was some confusion about how far these sharing obligations extended with the GPL. And so he put a file that said, basically, you know, there's kernel space and there's user space. And I don't consider things in user space that use standard systems calls to be derivative of the operating system. Right line, right line, sharing obligation extends to the kernel. User space is not GPL in his mind. It could be GPL, you put something else in there, but, but with respect to his uh, kernel, those obligations didn't extend in user space, became enormously valuable because that clarity enabled the commercial companies to, to get involved. So we're gonna go back to IBM for a minute because IBM is a lot of this story here. So there was a wonderful man, I should put his name up here too, but Irving Waldansky Berger uh, went, to, uh, went into the CEO's office at IBM and uh, and had he went in with one uh, what we at that time called foils. Do you remember the overhead projectors? Most of them don't, but yeah, but the overhead projectors where you go and they they kind of melted after a while and crinkled. He had this one slide and he put it up and he talked about it for four hours apparently. And uh, we just brought that slide back out a few years ago when we were doing the 25th anniversary of of, of Linux and everything on the slide came true. And what he said on that slide is that, that IBM, you have right now, and you're supporting, I think it was 32 different operating systems. And he had a, there was a sweep in the slide and it populated with all these different operating systems. And he said, you're supporting all of those. And you know, operating systems are very hard to write and you have your best minds working on those operating systems and maintaining those operating systems. That's an enormous opportunity loss because you know what? Your customers don't care about operating systems. No one buys anything from you because of the operating system. They buy from you because of the functionality that's delivered on top of it. So all of those people you have supporting all of those different operating systems could be much better deployed to parts of your stack that your customers actually value and care about. That was point one. And the other thing he said was, when you look at this sweep, and at that point he called it pervasive computing. And this was in like 1999, I think 1998, might have been 1997. Um, uh, he, pervasive computing, nobody knew what a cell phone was yet. But that's what it was, he just didn't know that. But he said, here we go from pervasive computing, and this was the sweep of the operating systems, all the way up to supercomputers. He said, let me talk to you about what you could do if you had one operating system that did all that, that went from pervasive computing all the way up to supercomputers. Let me tell you what you could do. And you know today, I know most of you have Apple and I'll tell you there's GPL code in your Apple phone too, but I could pull out my Android phone 
is Linux. 98% of the world's supercomputers, at least a few years ago, were all Linux. And almost everything in between, right down to Microsoft is now a member of the Linux Foundation and runs the Azure Cloud on Linux. Think of what you could do if you had one platform and everybody was making it better. Think of what you could do and everything he thought of came true. So the last thing I wanted to tell you about, oh, so one other great story. I just love this story. I hate this story. So Linus comes from Finland and he goes to work for a company called Transmeta. And you probably have never heard of Transmeta, but um, Mark Andreessen, who was the author of the original web browser, uh, had started a company called Transmeta. And uh, Linus came over to the United States to work at Transmeta. And uh, Transmeta was sold, I believe it was sold to HP. And so Linus was sort of, you know, not probably not going to hang around out of a job. So here are all these companies now. You know, IBM and HP and Intel and Qualcomm and Fujitsu. So any of these guys could have written Linus a check. Linus has four kids. You know, he could have written Linus a check and said, come work for us. And all of those companies realized that if any one of them hired Linus, none of them would trust the system anymore because somebody would have a special position, a special leverage. They created the Linux Foundation to maintain Linus's independence so that all of them who had become so dependent on that single thing could still trust the system for him to make decisions that were independent of any influence by any particular user. Pretty amazing. So I'm counsel to the Linux Foundation, which was created so that we could pay Linus's health insurance. You know? which is a pretty awesome thing. We bought him a really, really nice espresso machine. He worked, and if you've ever seen the pictures on the web of Linus's office, it's, um, it's, it's in his basement. Um, but Linus also, Linus is, uh, you know, just honors the whole developer, you know, centric world that is open source. And, um, and when there is a problem, he wants a technical solution. He does not call the lawyers in to fix things for him. And so uh, if for all of you who know Git, Linus not only write, wrote the Linux kernel, but Linus over about a week wrote Git, which is just an amazing accomplishment, amazing accomplishment. Uh, and you've all used that. So I want to talk just very briefly about licenses, just because of you, I, I know you're all just sitting on the edge of your seat, but um, this is terminology that becomes important. So Richard called his licenses free software. And the phrase is always, it's free as in freedom, not free as in beer. Nothing in the GPL does, says you can't charge for GPL software. What it says is you can't charge anybody downstream, you can't impose a royalty. But if you do work on GPL software and I deliver it to Keith, I can charge him for that. But I have to give him the freedom under the GPL to give Rudy that code and any modifications he creates under the GPL license with access to the source code. That's what free software is all about. The freedom to fix and share the code. Um, open source was a California concept. And that was much more based on, you know, the sort of open and collaboration. And there's a 10 point definition of an open source license. And that license does not require sharing source code. It, it, it has both the licenses that say, I'm going to give you this under the BSD or the MIT license. You can do anything you want with it as long as you give me an attribution, as long as you include my copyright notice in your, in your uh, documentation and disclaim any responsibility that I might have for your use. You, you can put that inside your proprietary software, as they call it, proprietary commercial software, and, and, and I may never see it again. That's a permissive license, and the Apache license is a great example of a permissive license. But the open source definition, uh, it became so important uh, to have a license meet that definition because people were calling everything an open source license. There were licenses that had assignments of all intellectual property rights. Oh, it's open source, the open source code. Um, so the open source initiative was created 
to take this definition and, be, and say, this license either does or doesn't meet these requirements. And they're very interesting requirements. They were written by um, a, a group of people, so I won't give any particular person credit because they uh, are a little sensitive about who actually put them all together. But Bruce's parents was, were very much involved. And, and they're brilliant. I mean, if you read them, they might seem odd, uh, some of them. Because for example, wouldn't you think that it was open source if I said, I'll give you the source code, but don't do anything evil with it? And the answer is no. No, it's not open source. Because as soon as you say that you can't do evil, somebody's got to figure out what evil is and somebody has to go chase everybody downstream to make sure they're not doing something evil. Open source means that we're all going to take that code and be able to use it as we wish and to pass it on without having responsibilities to anybody downstream. It's a very important uh, concept. Uh, uh, a techno technology, it can't be technology favorite. If you look at those 10, the open source initiative was the one that decided whether the licenses met those definitions. And they, when they got started, they, there was a license discuss list. Oh, you've never seen such flame wars. As, uh, as, as a license discuss list, whether or not it uh, actually met the definition. But after a while, one of the things they realized, and this is really why I put the slide up here, one of the things that they realized was that uh, they had approved at this point between 60 and 80 licenses. I think it's like 66 licenses. They said, this is not helpful. Do you see the possibility is that we're going to have 66 or 67, you know, isolated bodies of code potentially that can't be combined with other code because somebody had the, the uh, was vain enough to think that they needed their own license. There was an immediate and very strong message to the community that they were not going to approve additional open source licenses unless somebody could identify a need that was not met by the 10 most popular licenses already out there. And when we talk about license proliferation, when somebody says, oh, we'll make, we're, we're just going to write our own license, there is an enormous pressure not to do that because we learned the hard way that having lots of licenses, unfamiliar licenses, licenses that are written and you can't quite figure out what they mean, licenses that have typos in them, licenses that have commas in the wrong place, licenses that moved things around because of the white space and deleted line. All of those things are really, really distracting because now if I want to engage, I've got to go ask a lawyer what that license means. Whereas if I want to engage with something that's under the Apache license, my lawyer already knows what that means because everybody has, you know, has, has been spent some time that everybody, but, you know, most lawyers who work in this area have spent enough time that Apache is known as a comfortable, comfortable license. There are some people who have some arguments with it, but it's very broadly used. So when you're working with open source, if you hear this license proliferation and if you hear this very strong pushback that you're not going to, you know, roll your own, we call it. You know, you're not, don't roll your own. I will tell you that it came from hard experience uh, in, in having too many, because a license becomes the constitution of a community, but it also becomes potentially a barrier because it puts a fence sometimes around that community and says, you know, that we can only use that code for certain purposes. How do you choose a license? It's important that you choose the license because you're thinking about balancing the interests of those who are gonna contribute you want them to want to contribute. You want it to be, it be easy for them to contribute. And also the users, you know, who, who do you want to use this code? Make it easy for them to consume it. And then look at the other projects that are out there and look at the licenses those projects are over are, are under and make sure that those two licenses allow you to work together the way you want to work together with those projects. That's how you choose a license for a community. So now I'm going to talk about what I really wanted to talk about. And, and, I'm, how I, do I? Ar I love this phrase, architecture of participation. This is an O'Reilly phrase. What we do when we create a community like you just created is you build an architecture of participation. You haven't decided what you're going to build or where you're going to go or what your limits are or who's going to do it. You created a platform that calls forth hopefully the best and everybody in your community. And I love that phrase, the architecture of participation. 
Number one, when we're talking about the secret sauce of a, uh, of a successful open source project, it's built by and for developers. The very first people in these big companies that, that said, oh, you really need to understand open source and, and, uh, and, and tell us what, what you're doing with it were people in the HR department. Why? Because developers were coming from the best schools and they were used to using these open source tools and they couldn't hire people if they said, oh, we don't use any of that stuff. You know, it, it, developers became very central to, uh, to, to, the, uh, to the software industry in part because of this focus on open source. Uh, there's a wonderful presentation that was put together by uh, Larry Augustine many years ago, but he was talking about the software industry in, in, uh, in general, and, uh, and this was, was around the time of the bubble. Uh, and, and it was like 70 plus percent of a software company's budget went to sales and marketing. And it was like 10, 15% max that went to development. So do you want to know why the industry was in trouble? Now you give, I give you open source, which allows you to put a product out there and you can have a million users and not have paid a penny for any of them. If you can't build a business around that, shame on you. So, you know, this, this, uh, this idea that the, that, the, uh, that the developers were in the driver's seat. There are a lot of lawyers hanging around open source, but just like Linus, you know, just went and wrote Git, it's the developers who come up with the solutions all the time. It's not the lawyers, it is the developers. And the developers, these developers that work on Linux and some of these other projects are highly, highly valued by the companies that they work for. And lest you be confused about who open source developers are, there's a paper that's printed every year of who writes Linux. And number one is always Intel. You know, number two or three or four will be IBM, Qualcomm will be there, I mean, Microsoft's even on the list. Uh, it's, these are not people that are off working in their garage alone. Uh, they certainly aren't off working, eating pizza, which is what people used to say, oh, those guys aren't working in their garages. No, no, no. Software developers are the best organized people on earth. They're not eating pizza in a garage writing software. These are incredibly valuable human beings. And that developer-centric, you know, leave leanness alone, do not influence them uh, with marketing concerns and spin became a very important part of the environment. So I one uh, story that was really funny was there was a guy, I, I, I have to the top. Oh, I oh, good. I, have to, I was I wanted to make sure. I don't want to make you late. No. So I, I so I have time for another story. So I love this one. I was in a in a room one time. Um, where, where some of the kernel developers were, were talking about something and one of them turned to the other and said, said, Keith, did you, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use an, an I can't use a non uh, colorful word because it won't be as funny. <laughs> but Keith, did you really have to write that 2.6.2 really sucked? And he said, no. He says, but did you have to write that? I mean, would it, it would, but then they give people the warm and fuzzies. And he said, but it sucked. You know, it's like they don't have time for anything but the truth. You know, they 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 lived in the marketing world where where and because some one of the developers said to me one time, and it's just so helpful to understand for me to understand you. You know, why did you go home? So before you worked for Intel and wrote Linux, you wrote Linux at night at home. Why did you do that? Why did so many people do that in the early days before this was you know, something you did for a job? And they said, no, no, you don't understand. What it didn't make sense was what I did during the day. You see, I would go in and there would be some marketing person who would come up with some functionality that first of all, didn't make any sense. And second of all, it was never gonna work. And he had no clue what he was talking about. And they said, and we're gonna release it on Tuesday. And I said, that's not going to be ready on Tuesday. It's you know even, even if we could write it, it'd be full of bugs. Oh no, there's a trade show. We're going to announce it on Tuesday, and so you announce it on Tuesday, and it's full of bugs, and people wonder why the reputation of the software industry is it's full of bugs. And then I got to go home and pick out you know the the phrases you know they got to scratch their own itch. They would they would pick out something that they found interesting, and they would write code they were really proud of. And they would put it into a community where if you got your code accepted into Linux, it was because it was great code. It's not a friendly community all the time. It's pretty rough and tumble. You don't throw junk over the transom and hope it'll hit. 
you put in your best code, you hold your breath, and if it gets in there and you're a Linux kernel developer because you've contributed, that's something to be proud of. So what doesn't make sense about that? No time for anything but the truth. So there was another guy, Eric Raymond wrote, wrote an article uh, early in this called The Cathedral and the Bazaar. And there's still parts of this that, that uh, we hear about all the time. I love the phrase, you know, given enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow. And this is important. I wanted to put this up here because lots of people think, well, wait a minute, isn't that open source stuff? I can't have security problems, right? This is not a secret. This could be no, 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 Security problems come from bugs. The more people that can see the bugs, the more likely you're going to resolve it and resolve it quickly. Uh, open source and security are very consistent. And that message needs to get out there. there. Are there security problems with open source? Absolutely. I could give a whole presentation on the core infrastructure initiative and the Heartbleed bug and the whole thing, but it was fixed almost immediately. And you could have six guys who've ever seen the source code over here, or you could have a thousand people who've seen the source code over here. Which one do you think might get fixed first? You know, and when you've got 50 different companies that are all dependent on this code and they're all working on coming up with a fix, and this is one company with eight people who have other jobs, which one do you think is going to get fixed first? There's a very good security story around open source. But the cathedral and the bazaar was really about something else, too. And I mean, it was actually, it's about a whole bunch of things. But the, you know, the, the idea that a cathedral is built to a plan, you know, you get it all drawn even down to the gargoyles, you know, you've got, the, you've got the designs and you know what you're going to build before you start. See, that no longer works. Because when I started practice back in 1979, we would write these big development agreements. Like I remember one was 300 pages long. We had this whole product description and specification. We had a staffing plan. We had this, it went out over like five years. We were going to build this thing. I think it was a 256 KD RAM, which you can all laugh at. But we knew exactly what we were going to do, right? Well, of course, two days after we signed that and the engineers all got together, they said these specifications aren't right. We're never going to do this and we're never going to do that because we thought we knew what we were going to do but you really don't. Nobody's headlights are that long. And if we didn't know then, we really don't know now. So the idea of the cathedral and the bazaar was that he came into this thinking that the right way to write code was to have it fully spec'd out and architected. And he came into this community and learned that it is you know, release early, release often, build a little. It's an organic process, much more like a bazaar with lots of people working on different things. And this was like a conversion experience for him. This is very challenging to build an architecture of participation that supports this. But it's the only way anything really important will ever get built again. Uh, so speed, you know, agile programming, you folks know all of that. And there's huge changes coming because we used to have a very formal specification process in the computer, in the computer industry where people would go off, you know, three, four, five years, you'd have this secret stuff, only the secret people could talk. They, they figured out what the specification was. Eventually, you know, they came home. And, and then the specification would get released and there'd be this formal thing around it. And they'd say, here's the specification. And you know, today, the implementation of the open source project comes out and is released 20 times before you could sit down and even talk about a specification. So it's the implementation that becomes the de facto standard where we have to figure out how to work with something that moves at that pace. What is the architecture of participation around standards and implementations? We're figuring that out. Um, the other parts of, of this you know, architecture of participation is that if you think about an open source license as a license, you've lost its magic. Because what an open source license really is, is a development agreement. It's a non-negotiated development agreement. So instead of having the lawyers get together and do that you know, five-year negotiation, there's an open source license and you hang it like you hang it on a tree. It says, hey, we're gonna do something over here. Here's the terms. Nobody's gonna talk about them. If you wanna do it, that'd be great. Love to have your help. These are the terms and they just start working. It's, it has to be frictionless. If you have to run off and talk to a bunch of different people, you know, that the incentive of the, uh, of the developers to participate 
it really goes down. And we have big discussions about contribution agreements and other things that can force developers to have to go all the way up to their, their uh, uh, lawyers and, and, and uh, get approval to participate because they say, listen, this world works because if I see a bug, I can fix it. We have to build a world where if the developer sees a bug, the developer can fix it. We're really right back to Richard Stallman. Can I share my talents? There are so few of you. Do you realize how few people in the world have the ability to do what the people in this room have the ability to do? It's awesome. We need to leverage you. We do not need to hold you up. We need to build an architecture of participation so you can move as fast as possible to do the greatest things you could possibly do. The other thing that happens is, um, is you know, it started out that these pro projects were really individuals. They've now become these huge uh, uh, combinations of different corporations. So the Linux Foundation has about 900 members. Uh, OIN, which is a, a patent organization that supports it, has 1,300 licensees. We have probably 50 to 60 projects that are going on, and these are all corporations getting together that basically said this, you know that Linux thing that you built? Here's this other thing that we need that is basic infrastructure that everybody assumes is going to exist, but we shouldn't have six of them. We should have one and it should be great. We want to build this the way you built that. Can you help us build this the way you built that? And the first one was network uh, function, uh, what open daylight was a network function, for, uh, and to think, uh, it was it was, it was the virtualization of the network software for Cisco. I can't remember what the not letters stand for. Um, and there were, you know, they started out. They thought, well, if we could get five companies to do this, we could do it in eighteen months. If we don't do it together, it's going to take us ten years. And the reason is nobody's going to make an investment in Betamax. You know, I mean, you don't know it's Betamax. Betamax was apparently better technology, but until you know, you are not going to take your whole data center and put it in a particular virtualization uh, method and, and, and then find out that you made the wrong decision. That's too dangerous. But if we got everybody together and said, here's the northbound API, here's the southbound API, we're gonna build this together. And they came and said, can you help us build this the way you built Linux? And they wanted five members to launch. They had 13 when they started. There was a guy from Forbes who wrote an article said, this is ridiculous, this is never gonna work. 18 months later, he wrote an article and the title and the, you know, the subtitle was, I'm eating crow. This is amazing what they've accomplished. We have 50 of those, 50 projects. In those projects, the first thing that you have to know is that it's a level, level playing field. You have to know that there is a continuous commitment from the, from the people who are participating. Um, and there has to be complete transparency. Nobody's going to participate if they think they're going to get snored, that they're going to contribute to a project and somebody else is going to get the benefit. The reason they bring them to the Linux Foundation is they tried to launch them on their own and no one believed them that they weren't going to manipulate the project. They come to the Linux Foundation to put it into a level playing field, a trusted environment, you know, something that's open, that's governed in the open, and there are no secrets. There's no confidential information. Everything is out there. People can trust that they're not gonna get snubbed. And the results are made available to the entire world. We've gone through many times where people say, well, you know, we've got members and the members are paying something and shouldn't they get something special? And we have come firmly to believe, not just the Linux Foundation, but all of these 800 companies that participate, that when you give somebody something special, you have lost the magic. You don't have startups that are participating. You don't have people around the globe that are participating. You've locked it into certain companies, which may not be the right companies. If you're going to make the investment, make it available to everybody, make it a platform for innovation for the entire world and everybody will benefit. Now, these companies don't go into this out of some you know, kumbaya moment. That, this, is, this is enlightened self-interest. This is building infrastructure, and they're going to build businesses, very profitable businesses, on top of this. This, is, this is, is coming together as a community to build the infrastructure like we used to build roads and bridges and things that everybody needs. We don't want the government building our technical infrastructure. We want developers building their technical infrastructure and we want them building, they want, we want it to be built for everybody and for the long term and we want it to be maintained. 
And once you do that, you get this dependence. And this is one of the real secret part or parts of the secret sauce is that when you have a lot of companies totally dependent and vulnerable on a particular infrastructure, you know, like Linux, but lots, like the Apache web server, like lots of other things, they will not let it go down. They can't. They're all in it together. They're all in it together. So I am going to give you my, my little bit of a, you might call me naive. I just think we all need a little bit of hope. Um, you know, Thomas Friedman wrote that no two countries that both had McDonald's had ever gone to war. You ever hear that? Uh, and, you know, and he talks about, you know, opportunity and the importance of opportunity. I personally don't think that countries that are completely dependent upon the infrastructure that they built together will ever go to war either. I think it's really important that the most international place I ever go is a kernel developer summit. They all speak source code. They all value each other's input. And all those companies, including Huawei, and who's also in the Linux Foundation board, which is a company in China, and the companies in Japan, and the companies in Korea, and the companies in Europe, the companies in, in uh, uh, you know, Romania, and, uh, and the Ukraine, all those companies, they're all building it together. They're all dependent upon it, and they're all vulnerable if it goes down. If this is a security problem, they all respond together. I think that may be the most important thing I can work on, and that's why I do. So there's my message. Build it for the developers. Don't build it for the lawyers. Don't build it for the marketing people. Build it for the developers. And if you build it right, they'll all come. Thank you very much. Well, that was great. <laughs> uh, are there any questions, Karen? Do you have time to take a couple of questions? Sure, as long as I don't run over. Yeah. You were right with me the whole time. <laughs> you know, the open source is kind of going leaps and bounds thanks to GitHub community and, you know, many awesome projects that have been going on. But if you know, in the recent past, Oracle suing Google, Apple suing Google, Apple suing Samsung. So there's a really good trend like, i uh, sue somebody and get money. Uh, what is your take on how the future will go um, in terms of, you know, uh, rights like that? Yeah. Oh, that's a, that's, that's a, it's an interesting question. All of the above are members of the Linux Foundation, by the way. It's interesting. Um, there's two different kinds of, of uh, things that, that, uh, that that brings to mind. I mean, one is, is really figuring out software patents um, because a lot of those suits are really about software patents. And, uh, and you know, a, a lot of companies have a huge investment in software patents. Um, I, I have to say, I just don't see the value in them myself. Um, I, you know, work for a firm that has lots of really unbelievably smart developers who are, you know, patent people and they really, they believe in that and companies believe in it. But, um, but, uh, the way we have fixed the patent problems around Linux, because you're not talking about claims against Linux, you're talking about claims against other things is again, the shared vulnerability. So we have this thing called Open Invention Network, which is a, 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 a you know, patent program around Linux. But it's, you know, it's not commercially reasonable. And I, but I, don't, I don't mean that by somebody being, it doesn't make any commercial sense for a company that is dependent upon Linux to sue Linux. It's just too, it's too painful. It's too disruptive to their commercial relationships. It's, um, you know, so let me let me take a step back because I'm I'm struggling a little bit here, but because you, you have to know what I think first about about contracts and uh, and companies. So when I went to IBM in 1979, one of the things that I worked on first, which just amazed me, was this really old use tax case 
And I was trying to figure out what the use tax was on. You know, I mean, I was looking through this stuff. It took me a long time to figure it out. But a few years before that, so like 1976, 1975, 1977, that plant, which is up in northern Vermont, it's a, it was a semiconductor plant, that plant took in sheet metal and chemicals and shipped out semiconductors. It was completely and totally independent. There was no semiconductor industry, you know, tool industry. There were no vendors. Um, it, it, no, I mean, nobody knew how to do that except them. When I got there in 1979, uh, there was, you know, we were creating Semitech Tech, which was a group of semiconductor vendors around, you know, around the world. And the relevance here is that that companies in the 60s and 70s thought they stood alone. You know, they thought that they controlled their own destiny. And you see today, if you think about a company, what a company is, is a bunch of intellectual property and some people who are inextricably linked to that intellectual property and a whole bunch of contracts that define their dependency on everybody else. They don't own their buildings. They don't own their distribution channels. They, you know, they, many times they don't actually directly employ their employees. They're, I mean, what, what do they actually own? They own a network of relationships that are defined by contracts. And the things that companies are learning is that you can't sue the parties on whom you're dependent. You know, that's a really painful thing to do, is to sue those people upon whom you're dependent. So um, the suits that you're talking about are between traditional competitors that are battling you know, over big territories. I mean, Google and Oracle and other things like that. But at the, you know, at, at another level, litigation is at an all-time low because we all are a network of these dependencies. And when you go to buy a company, what you're buying is all of those contracts that they have with all of those other companies without which they cannot function. That's what you buy, so those relationships. And the other thing that's kind of hopeful, just since you got me on this, is the other thing that's kind of hopeful is, is that when you think of all that intellectual property, you think of, you know, the patents, and we, we've gone through periods where the big concern was all about patent litigation. That was the last issue in every contract. When you think about it now, the biggest asset that most companies have is their brand. Why is that? It's because people deal with companies at a long distance and they deal with them because they have some confidence that that company is reliable. You know, when you don't walk down to your corner store and know who you're buying from, you buy from somebody that you have confidence in. And if they lose that confidence, they've lost everything. And they don't get a lot of confidence by going out and suing a bunch of people. So, you're absolutely right. In the Google Oracle case, I, I mean, I have to tell you personally, it makes me want to cry because the, the lower court opinion, which, which I thought was just a masterful history of software law, got overturned in, a, in an opinion that I, don't, I can't make hybrid tales of. It was the litigation over whether APIs are copyrightable or not. And it'll take us a long time to sort that out. Uh, but I think we're going to see less and less litigation. Somebody said to me a long time ago that, you know, um, when it takes five to six years to litigate something, the only thing that will ever will be litigated are patent cases, because patents are 20 years, and constitutional cases, because they're important, and everything else people ought to settle. And I think that's about right. I'll ask one question here. Mm -hmm. So one of the challenges that I think we have in our field that I don't see as a challenge software is that we have you know sitting amongst us some conditions that are integral to the process. And so we can't just build for developers. We have to build for developers and scientists and physicians. Yes. Any advice? Yeah. Well and I should say because Steve and I have had this conversation many times that you know when I'm talking about the computer science, many of these things don't track what your experience will be. And I want to be clear that I, I don't Propose that I have a clue of the challenges that you're going to have. But I guess I would say, just in general, I would change everything I said from the word developer to scientist. I mean, people, so here's, here's another story, and then I really will get off. I've got just a few minutes. But this is important. 
this is important. You people, you know, and whether it's, it's the physicians and the scientists and everybody else are able to do things, there are very few people on earth. And you're employed by unbelievable institutions that, you know, have their own interests. But I want you to think for a minute about the deep water horizon. So here you've got a problem. It's at the bottom of the Gulf, deeper than anybody had gone. How many people on earth do you think had any idea when that thing blew up on Tuesday, what should be done on Wednesday or Thursday? Very few. And where were those people? Do you think there was anybody in the government that had any clue what deep water drilling actually required? And that this isn't a knock on the government. This that isn't a political statement. It's a statement of reality that anybody who steps out of that stream of you know com commercial companies where it's evolving every day and where things are changing, anybody who steps out of that stream and goes into another role is instantly behind. It was that's not a knock at the government. It's just that there's nobody in government that has any clue whatsoever what actually ought to happen at the bottom of that. Where were where is all that expertise? Where is all that expertise? It's in the other companies, right? So you've got two companies, you've got BP and you've got a, well, actually I guess there were three, a couple of other companies that were, were involved. And they had a pretty good idea, but nobody trusted them. Who else had a good idea? The other companies in that industry, and you know what they did? They stepped back. Don't want to get involved. Don't want to get involved. No one else, no one else knew. How long did it take us to put that plan together? How many days, how many weeks did it gush because we didn't have an architecture of participation to solve those technical problems? How many days will we wait for, for, uh, you know, for, for cancer research while you know, we try to figure out where, where the paperwork is? So I would just say, you know, everything I said says that we have people in this world who actually understand the way things work and the way things happen at a technical level. And they are human resources, meaning that they're resources to all of humanity. And every company and every employer needs to have some sense of the responsibility that they have to deploy those resources to their very best ability. And they will be very profitable if they do that. And when we build these, these architectures of participation, as long as we are true to science, and as long as we keep the marketing people pretty far away, and as long as we listen to the, to the technical solutions rather than the paperwork solutions, we will all be very successful. Thank you very much.